Good afternoon, everybody. Happy Monday. Let me do a couple of. Uh, let me do uh, two things at the top, and then um, and then we'll get to your questions. Uh, the first is, as you heard the president on Friday, um, he will be attending the uh, climate talks in Paris to meet with world leaders about a global agreement to address this serious issue. Uh, the president will be attending on Monday, November 30th, and Tuesday, December 1st. Uh, in Paris, the United States will be pushing for an agreement that does three things. Uh, the first is that we're looking for an agreement that reflects the ambitious climate targets from all of the countries who are participating. Uh, second, uh, the, we're looking for an agreement that puts in place a long-term framework that incentivizes countries to ratchet down their emissions over time in a transparent manner with high standards of accountability and with the goal of achieving a low carbon transformation by the end of the century. Uh, and third, we're looking for an agreement that mobilizes ongoing financial and technical support for low carbon development and climate adaptation, especially for the poorest and most vulnerable countries. Uh, we know that the, some of the poorest countries are the ones who are most vulnerable to the um, uh, most tangible uh, uh, climate impacts uh, that are already being felt uh, around the globe. Uh, scientists and experts firmly agree that we're already feeling the effects of climate change. Uh, both here in the United States and around the globe, and without action, uh, these impacts pose a clear threat to our economic uh, and national security. Uh, I'll note that to uh, explain, to help explain why the President is committed to acting on climate change and what's at stake both for the Paris talks and beyond, uh, the President earlier today released a video on his brand new Facebook page. Uh, and if you haven't taken a look at it, I encourage you to uh, check it out. Uh, the second thing, uh, we had uh, elections over the weekend in Burma. Uh, and I just wanted to uh, do a quick statement on that. Uh, the United States congratulates the people of Burma on the election and commend all of the people and institutions in the country who work together uh, to hold a peaceful and historic election. Uh, we're seeing initial reports of results, but we encourage everyone to wait for the Union Election Commission's official results and their final reports from domestic uh, and the final reports from domestic and international observer missions before making assessments. Uh, but what is clear is that for the first time ever, millions of people in Burma voted in a meaningful, competitive election. And despite some structural and systemic flaws, we believe that Sunday's vote represents an important step in Burma's democratic reform process. Uh, the U.S. Embassy team was impressed by the enthusiasm of the people of Burma, which was indicated by the long lines, apparent high voter turnout, and the diversity of voices coming to the polls. Young people, women, and members of ethnic groups were all represented, uh, and they were keen to have their voices heard. Uh, we're also encouraged by public statements from um, President Thane Sein uh, and the Commander-in-Chief, saying they would accept the results, uh, as well as Aung San Suu Kyi and the National League uh, for Democracy's remarks encouraging calm and acceptance of the results. Uh, it's important for all political leaders to work together to form a new government and for stakeholders to help to ensure calm and pursue na national reconciliation. Uh, so with that out of the way, Josh, we can go to your questions. Thanks, Josh. Why don't we just stay right there for a minute? Okay. Uh, the early results from this election seem to be uh, showing a pretty overwhelming uh, victory if things continue to go the way they are for uh, Aung San Suu Kyi's party. Uh, the president has obviously invested a lot in Myanmar's emergence from military rule. Um, she can't become the president, but she's basically said if her party wins an overwhelming victory, she will act as the leader of the country anyway. Uh, given the emphasis that the U.S. has placed on a rigorous democratic process in Myanmar, um, do you see it possible for her to have a, a role as the country's leader, even if she's not actually elected under their constitution? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, let me say a couple things about that, Josh. I mean, the, I, I think most directly I would say that it's already clear uh, that uh, Aung San Suu Kyi has uh, had a powerful voice uh, in um, bringing about some much needed reform and change to the uh, political system inside of Burma. Uh, but ultimately, what uh, set of official responsibilities she have will be uh, the responsibility of uh, the Burmese people and the Burmese government uh, to determine. The, 
the second thing is, you know, we've acknowledged that there were uh, some flaws uh, in the uh, political system there. And, you know, I would include in that category the law that uh, specifically uh, targets her by suggesting that because she has a, um, I believe the law is that she, because she has a, um, a spouse of, uh, that lives in another country, uh, that she uh, uh, cannot serve as president. And, um, you know, so these are, this is an indication that additional reforms are needed and additional work um, needs to be done uh, to bring about the kind of uh, effective uh, and democracy, representative democracy we'd like to see. Uh, another one of those uh, rules is that right now 25% of the parliamentary seats are guaranteed to the military. Um, so you know, there, there are some uh, imperfections, uh, to put it mildly. Um, but there's also no denying the uh, rather dramatic uh, change that we've seen inside of Burma. Um, and the United States has played an important role in trying to nurture that change and give the Burmese people uh, a, more of a voice in the governing of their country. Uh, and the Burmese people can continue to count on uh, the United States being a partner uh, and strongly supporting uh, their efforts to realize the kind of government uh, that they'd like to have for their country. Returning to the attack in Jordan that the President referenced this morning, uh, there's been some various reporting and different details emerging from that, uh, possibly up to six or, uh, or more that have passed away as a result of that. Do you have any update? I know the President said two or three uh, of exactly what the fatalities and other circumstances were. Uh, Josh, the latest update that I have uh, is that there were two U.S. trainers who were killed uh, and two others who were wounded in a shooting incident today um, at the Jordan International Police Training Center southeast of Amman. Um, I understand that in addition to the Americans who were involved, uh, that there was a South African trainer and a Jordanian trainer uh, who were killed. Uh, I also know that there were other Jordanian Lebanese individuals who were wounded. Uh, and as the President said, our heartfelt, heartfelt condolences go out to the families of all of those uh, who were affected by this terrible inc incident. Uh, the brave individuals who were killed and injured were training Jordanian, Lebanese, and Palestinian security forces. And a cowardly act like this one only reinforces the determination of the United States uh, and our partners around the world uh, to, uh, uh, to stand up uh, with, uh, uh, with those countries that are trying to build uh, the kind of police force and law enforcement uh, that's critical to preserving security and order inside their countries. Uh, so we strongly condemn this incident, uh, and we deeply appreciate the cooperation and support uh, that we've already received from our Jordanian partners. On the meeting with uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu this morning, the President mentioned, uh, short of a two-state peace <coughs> deal that the administration now sees as unlikely during the rest of the President's term, he'd like to see uh, discuss with Netanyahu ways to lower tensions, get Israelis and Palestinians back on a path toward peace. Did he get any kind of a roadmap from Netanyahu? Did he have any specific asks for the Prime Minister um, and any details uh, from Netanyahu about what he might be willing to do in that regard? Mm -hmm. Well, Josh, as I walked out here, the meeting between uh, the President and the Prime Minister was still ongoing. Uh, so that's going to limit my ability to provide a, a particularly detailed readout of their conversation. The expectation, uh, sir, well, let me say it this way. This item was on the agenda. Uh, and I think you heard both leaders refer to it in the comments that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu and President Obama made to all of you uh, before their meeting began. And you know, the reason that this is on the agenda is obviously goes to uh, something that is a top priority of both leaders, which is the safety and security of uh, the nation of Israel. And uh, the, President Obama believes that the uh, security interests of the people of Israel are best served and even advanced through um, reaching a, a, a two-state solution to, uh, to try to um, resolve that, that conflict. And uh, that long-simmering conflict has, um, uh, has continued to um, uh, create the kind of instability that allows uh, violence to take root. And you know, the, the President Obama and obviously Secretary Kerry and uh, Secretary Clinton before him invested a lot of time and effort uh, in trying to bring both sides to the negotiating table to facilitate uh, uh, an outcome here similar to the, uh, along the lines of the two-state solution that the United States has long advocated. 
Uh, and you know, ultimately what is clear is that the political leaders on both sides are going to have to make some difficult uh, decisions, including some decisions that in the short term may be politically unpopular with their people, but over the long term are going to be critical to um, uh, the success and advancement uh, of people on both sides of that issue. So uh, the, the President continues to uh, uh, stand ready to facilitate uh, those kinds of conversations, uh, but um, obviously we've got a, uh, a long way to go before something like that's likely to occur. And just on one other topic, does the President agree with the Anti-Doping uh, Commission's uh, suggestion, recommendation that uh, Russian track and field athletes be banned from the Olympics as a result of uh, what they're calling the Russian government's complicity in some of this doping activity? Uh, Josh, I've seen those reports today. Uh, obviously, the, uh, this Anti-Doping Commission is an international organization that's independent uh, of any um, specific government body, certainly independent of the United States government. Uh, and those kinds of decisions will ultimately have to be made by international um, by the international authorities that govern these athletic competitions. Um, so we certainly made note of those reports, but ultimately those, uh, you know, Russia's involvement uh, and the degree to which their uh, track and field team is involved in the next Olympics will be something that uh, those anti-doping authorities and uh, Olympic authorities will ultimately have to determine. Okay. Jeff. Josh, back um, to Burma. Does this election have any implications or further implications for sanctions, business links, or trade? Uh, at this point, I, I don't have any uh, uh, changes to announce in with, with that regard. Obviously, this is something that the uh, Treasury Department closely monitors. Uh, so uh, I'd refer you to them for any changes that they may be planning, but I'm not aware of any right now. Okay. And would, um, if the military accepts the results of this election, would the United States reconsider military to military ties with, with Myanmar? Mm -hmm. uh, at, at this point, it's too early to, uh, to suggest uh, exactly what changes in, in U.S. policy would be brought about by the outcome of this election and the way that it's received by uh, all sides. Uh, you, you know, during the President's two visits to, to Burma now, you have seen um, uh, not just a willingness but a desire uh, to, uh, to deepen the ties between our two countries and to deepen the relationship uh, between the United States and Burma. Uh, but uh, at this point, I don't have any uh, possible policy changes to announce. On uh, the meeting with the Prime Minister, and I recognize that it's still ongoing, but do you, are you able to say whether or not um, Prime Minister Netanyahu's remarks to Congress earlier this year came up or will come up during their one-on-one? -on -one? Uh, I, I don't know if, uh, if Prime Minister Netanyahu's uh, address uh, will be discussed. I know that the issue of um, preventing Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon was an item that was on the agenda. It is, as the President uh, alluded to in his uh, remarks before the meeting, uh, while there may be a disagreement between our two countries about this particular diplomatic uh, agreement, uh, there's no disagreement uh, and no daylight between the United States and Israel when it comes to our commitment to preventing Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon uh, and our desire to cooperate to prevent um, uh, or at least mitigate uh, the destabilizing activities that Iran often engages in. In, uh, in that region of the world. All right, and lastly, you opened up uh, your remarks today by talking about the Paris Conference. Mm -hmm. Does the United States come <coughs> with anything in hand to that conference? Obviously, the, you've already, the President has already announced uh, U.S.'s commitment on, on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. What else does he bring this time as a bargaining chip to help push leaders in the direction that you want them to go? Mm -hmm. Well, Jeff, at this point, I think that you have seen the United States make a substantial uh, contribution uh, and a substantial commitment to uh, handling business in our own country when it comes to reducing carbon pollution. Uh, and we saw that that firm commitment on the part of the United States um, elicited a similarly strong commitment from uh, the Chinese government uh, in terms of uh, capping their carbon emissions uh, and making investments in renewable energy and uh, other technologies that will uh, allow their, their economy to continue to uh, grow, uh, but while making uh, uh, decisions that are clearly in the best interest of the public health of the citizens of that country, but also uh, the public health of citizens across the planet. Uh, and um, you know, that obviously was an important step. You know, we talked about this a little bit on Friday, that uh, many skeptics of climate policy in the United States suggested that it was foolish 
for the United States to begin to take important steps to cut carbon pollution uh, because those steps wouldn't have nearly the intended impact if we couldn't get China and other of the world's largest economies to go along. So I think what's notable about that announcement is it directly uh, uh, takes on the chief criticism of our political opponents. And uh, it does demonstrate that by using our influence around the globe uh, and by making uh, progress on these bold uh, about on this bold policy agenda of the President's, uh, that we can do something important for the planet. We can do something important for the health uh, and well-being of our kids here, who are obviously the first affected by uh, poor air quality. But we can also do something good for our economy. And, you know, one of the things that's notable about the uh, commitment that China made to uh, cap their carbon emissions uh, is that it was going to require investment in uh, new technology to generate power in that country. And one source of that power generation uh, is nuclear power plants. And those are nuclear power plants that uh, will uh, be constructed, at least in part, by U.S. companies. So this is economic growth and jobs that are being created here in the United States uh, because of this global commitment to, uh, uh, to doing something about uh, climate change. My, my question is, is that, is that what the President brings, basically a, a discussion of everything that he has done? Or are there anything else in, is there anything else in the bag or in his hand that he will bring as a incentive to get other countries to move along? Well, I certainly wouldn't rule out necessarily any um, future commitments, but the kinds of commitments that the United States has already made are significant and have elicited uh, significant commitments from other countries already. And I think they make clear that uh, President Obama is determined to show American leadership uh, on this issue. Uh, and that based on the U.S. commitment to this issue, other countries can feel confident in following through on their commitments, knowing that they're going to have the desired effect, knowing that we're going to be able to um, uh, confront uh, the significant challenge of climate change in this country and in, in, on this planet. Okay. April. Josh, there's a big story that's getting a lot of momentum, particularly after this weekend, out of the University of Missouri, um, the racial issues. Uh, the governor of Missouri, uh, Governor Nixon, and Senator Claire McCaskill, alum of the school, chimed in. Is the president saying anything about this, and what does the White House say? Uh, April, I, I haven't spoken to the president about this uh, news story, but I did read quite a bit about it um, over the weekend myself. Uh, Missouri is my home state. I didn't attend the University of Missouri, but uh, it's obviously a, a, a campus that I visited many times, and I have many friends who've attended there. It's. Um, the people of Missouri are justifiably proud uh, of that education, of, of that institution of higher learning. And there's a, um, the, the people of Missouri take great pride in the institution of, that is the, the University of Missouri. And I think what is notable about many of the events that we saw uh, over the weekend is the way that that campus has really rallied together uh, in support of the idea that every student that is admitted to the University of Missouri uh, has a place on that campus and in that community. Uh, and that commitment to unity uh, and equality and justice uh, is, um, uh, is one that uh, I think the people of Missouri and certainly the, uh, the, the Mizzou community uh, can be proud of. But that's not, you don't get that result, uh, the result of every student on campus feeling like they have a place um, by just hoping that it will happen. It requires work. It requires painstaking effort. Uh, and I think what we've seen is a commitment on the part of so many pe different members of that community uh, to pursue that goal. Uh, and that's a really important thing. And you know, th this, I, I think this also illustrates the, um, something that the President talked a lot about in the context of uh, uh, in his campaign, uh, that a few people speaking up and speaking out can have a profound impact on the communities that, uh, where we live and work. Uh, this is a small group of students who stood up to make their, uh, their voices heard and their views clear and their concerns public. And this had an impact on people all across that campus, including members of the football team, uh, who obviously speak with, a quite, with uh, quite a loud voice. Uh, but they were able to count on the support of, uh, of their coaches. Uh, other members of the faculty, you know, I read in some of the news reports that the, uh, that the, that the, uh, the, the highest ranking uh, administration official on campus in Columbia 
actually spent time yesterday bringing food to the students who are camped out uh, in protest and spending time talking to those student leaders. Uh, that's the kind of dialogue and work and unity uh, that the um, uh, that the Mizzou community is going to uh, need uh, to make progress on this issue. So you say it was a small group of people, and I, I understand that, but the small group of people made a very loud noise with racial slurs, anti-Semitic graffiti, swastikas drawn in feces. I mean, and I hate to be that graphic, but this is real. Does this require the Justice Department to possibly take a look at what's happening there? I mean, you have four campuses in that system, and you have had to have the football team force the president of the university to step down. So do you think it's time for the Justice Department to come and take a look? I mean, I hear you talk about the conversation, but this is a little bit deeper than a conversation. And you also had a Confederate flag, uh, and you, you're allowed to, to show who you support, freedom of expression but a Confederate flag driving around that university at this time where tensions are still hot. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, to be, just to be clear about my first answer, April, when I was referring to a, a small group of people, I was talking to the small group of students at the University of Missouri uh, who decided to uh, work together to make their voices heard, to raise these concerns, and to make sure that the concerns of minority students on campus at the University of Missouri were uh, getting the uh, attention that they deserved. And that did inspire a broader movement and a broader statement from what started out as a, uh, a group of uh, uh, some of the members of the football team and grew into the support of the entire team and the, the coaching staff. Uh, and again, I think that's a testament to uh, the um, unity of purpose that exists on that campus. And, uh, but that unity of purpose is not going to be enough. As I mentioned earlier, this is going to be uh, hard work. Uh, to eventually uh, uh, obtain this, uh, achieve this goal of uh, making sure that it's clear that every uh, member of that community uh, has a rightful place there to be uh, a contributor to that community and to feel uh, at home there. And there, there's work that needs to be done. And um, I, I think I, I, I take great satisfaction, uh, particularly when talking about my home state, in seeing so many people come together uh, determined uh, to make progress on a, a very difficult question that is laced with uh, some difficult history in that state. I'm in agreement with you there, but do you think at this point that there was a violation in hate, there was a, there was a hate crime, uh, or hate crimes, as well as civil rights violations that have occurred on those, on those four campuses? Uh, that's obviously something that law enforcement officials will have to consider, and the Justice Department will have to consider that on their own, and I wouldn't want to say anything uh, here that would uh, be perceived as in any way influencing uh, any, de any decisions that they may or may not have to make. Okay. Chip. Given your familiarity with uh, Missouri and the University of Missouri, are you surprised about the kind of acts that uh, April just uh, detailed, the anti-Semitic and racist behavior on that campus? Yeah. Well, I, I think um, I think there are a couple different ways to answer that question. I think, you know, any, any um, uh, state institution uh, is a product of uh, the state and that state's history. Uh, and there's a very painful history, and it's not ancient history uh, in the state of Missouri. Uh, and again, I, I think it is a testament to the courage uh, of the people on, on campus at uh, the University of Missouri who are speaking out, that they are um, standing up to confront uh, those, those issues. I think the other thing that's important, Chip, and I think it's important that we don't lose this um, in the debate either. This debate's going on in a, you, this debate is not just occurring at the University of Missouri, uh, that there are discussions about some of these issues uh, that are taking place uh, in campuses all across the country. Uh, and I, you know, just reading in the newspaper today that there's uh, been some concerns about the uh, environment uh, at Yale right now. Uh, it's obviously a, a very different situation. It's a private institution, the University of Missouri is a public institution. Uh, the scale of uh, uh, the source of their concerns is a little bit different, but it does go to this sort of fundamental issue uh, about these uh, college campuses, uh, ensuring that there's a home for everybody. Now, we expect college campuses are going to be uh, places where people's views are challenged, uh, and that there is a, a, a you know a vibrant uh, debate uh, on campus, uh, and that's something that we want to preserve. That's what the best institutions of higher learning in this country have. Uh, but we also need to make sure that uh, that everybody who's on that campus uh, feels like they have a home. Is this a teachable moment that the president might weigh in on? Uh, I wouldn't uh, speculate at this point uh, whether or not he uh, would make a public statement on it, but uh, 
presumably the next opportunity that one of you has to talk to him, maybe uh, you'll ask him about it. Exactly. All right. Can I follow back? But why not, sure. though? I mean, we have seen, I mean, and, and we've heard some of this. I'm not ruling it out, April. I'm just saying that I don't know. Okay, well, that's a possible, so it's a possibility that he could. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, I suppose you can say that. Let me ask you this, though. Some are trying to inference that this situation that's happening at the University of Missouri is an outgrowth of Ferguson, possibly because of many of the protests. This nation right now is still dealing with issues of race, be it the police and the black community issue or some other issues. You are hearing a lot of the, the tension from some of the candidates when it comes to other communities. This White House, and in, in any White House, is looked at as the moral uh, setter for, for the climate. And going back to Bill Clinton, he tried to talk about the heart issue, not just the legislative issue of race. Do you think that it could be time for this president, who is African American, to talk about the heart issue of race, as this nation is a nation that is brown? Yeah, and I think that he's done that many, many times. And I would anticipate that. Just in a press conference, maybe have a, a dialogue, a, a town hall. I'm, I'm, I'm just asking. Yeah, uh, I don't, I don't envision anything like that right now. John, um, is there anything further on the? downing of the Russian plane, any further indication of terrorism? Uh, at this point, John, I don't have an updated uh, uh, intelligence assessment. Um, and we continue to um, uh, work hard to collect as much information as we can to uh, try to learn what exactly happened uh, with that tragic incident. Uh, again, based on the information that we've already learned, uh, we at this point uh, can't rule out the, the possibility of terrorist involvement. Uh, but as we uh, collect information, we do a couple of things with it. The first is uh, we make sure that we're using that information to adjust appropriately the security posture uh, at airports around the world. Uh, and there have been some steps that have been taken by the Department of Homeland Security to beef up security at a handful of airports in the region. Uh, we're also using that information to um, uh, share it with investigators. Uh, obviously, the Egyptians and the Russians are leading this investigation. And uh, when we have uh, information that we can share with them, we're, uh, we're doing that. And do you agree with uh, Congressman Adam Schiff, who said that if this bomb was truly planted by ISIS, that ISIS has now fully eclipsed Al Qaeda as the gravest terror threat in the world? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think I think it, at this point it is um, important to understand that the United States, and certainly in recent months, has been keenly aware of the extremist threat that's emanating from the Sinai Peninsula, and that there have been uh, travel warnings and notice to uh, aircraft operating in the skies over the Sinai Peninsula about precautions that they should take given uh, the uh, significant extremist threat there. Um, uh, at this point, I, I think the, uh, I think the, as it relates to that question, I think there's a, a need on the part of the administration to take the threats both from ISIS and Al Qaeda quite seriously. And they're not dissimilar, uh, but they are uh, threats that are worthy of uh, our attention and it's uh, attention that it's received for quite some time. Okay, but, but I, I mean, because obviously the, the president in the past has suggested that, uh, you know, core Al Qaeda was the, was the, was the, was the preeminent threat. Mm -hmm. um, and, and now you have this Adam Schiff, top Democrat on the Intelligence Committee, saying that we may see a situation here, if, if this was in fact ISIS, that ISIS is now the preeminent threat in the world today. Do you, do you, I mean, the president in the past has quite frankly kind of, I don't want to say downplayed, but in the, but in, in, in the comparison with, with Al Qaeda, he has portrayed ISIS as you know, JV team in the famous phrase uh, um, uh, in the New Yorker interview. But I mean, do, are, have, have we now seen a a point a where, where, where ISIS is, uh, well, is uh, the preeminent threat? I, I think that given the significant resources that have been committed to our counter-ISIL campaign uh, and the fact that we've been able to build the support of 65 countries to uh, carry out a, a, a range of elements uh, of our strategy to degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL, I think is an indication. You've, that you've done that, that you made the case that it's a regional threat. And so that what Schiff is saying something more, he's saying that this is now, you know, fully eclipsed Al Qaeda as the gravest terror threat in the world, mm -hmm. which would suggest it's far more than a regional problem. Well, I think we've been mindful of the risk that, uh, that ISIL poses even outside the region. I think what we've said is that uh, most of their uh, aspirations are focused uh, on that region, but 
you know, we've noted the fact that they have uh, attempted to radicalize uh, people all around the globe using social media, including to carry out uh, acts of violence in places outside of the region. So we've been mindful of the broader threat uh, that ISIL poses. Uh, and you know, at this point, I, I think what the president's focused on is making sure that all of the threats as they emerge are uh, appropriately mitigated and that we're using the wide range of our military capability and our intelligence capability to try to protect the American people, whether that threat emanates from Al Qaeda or from ISIL. Okay, and there's one other, uh, you probably saw some of the controversy questions raised about Ben Carson and what he's saying about his personal, I don't want you to comment on any of that. Uh, but he did say something about Wait the president. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you'd like, that's fine. But, uh, um, uh, he, he, he did say that he does not remember this level of scrutiny for one President Obama in 2008. I assume he means Senator Obama, but, yeah. but, but then candidate Obama. He, he, he suggested that, that, that Barack Obama had nothing of this kind of scrutiny when he was running for president. Do you, uh, do you agree with that, that Ben Carson has been subject to more scrutiny than Barack Obama? Uh, I don't agree with that statement. You don't. Uh, I, mean, I think many of you who have covered, uh, you know, both the 2008 campaign and the uh, and this campaign, I think, um, can obviously draw your own conclusions based on the work that uh, that all of you have done. I think the important thing, John, is for people to remember, and this is sort of one thing that I have freely said about the ongoing presidential race that I have at times been reluctant to weigh in on, uh, is that this process is good for our democracy. It's not easy to run for president. It shouldn't be. And that people, when they make public comments, uh, are going to have their claims scrutinized, uh, even if they're claims about their own biography. And that's, uh, that's part of the process. And it was difficult uh, when those questions uh, were raised about uh, Senator Obama. Uh, it was particu particularly difficult when uh, some of those claims were, um, or questions were, um, I guess in 2008, I recall in an, uh, a situation in which uh, it was less the claims of President Obama that were being questioned uh, and more that the claims about him were difficult to disprove, uh, at least to the satisfaction of our harshest critics. Um, what's, one of whom was running for president. Uh, one of whom was running for president. But what's true now uh, is a situation where you have uh, Dr. Carson's own claims uh, that he has long been making and written about. Uh, that are being subjected to uh, scrutiny. And that's an important part of the process. Uh, it ensures that whoever emerges from this difficult process is somebody that's capable of, uh, of leading the country. But most importantly, uh, it gives voters the opportunity to carefully consider uh, the candidates' views and their claims in depth before they have to go to uh, uh, the voting booth or show up at a caucus location. I, you know, the, Senator Obama, a staple of his stump speech used to be that he would travel to Iowa and he spent so much time going to town hall meetings and talking to people in coffee shops because people like to lift the hood and kick the tires. Uh, and uh, uh, it's good to know that that, uh, that 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 tradition is alive and well because it's uh, important to the success of our democracy. These are appropriate questions that Ben Carson's facing right now. Well, uh, it's not really, I happen to think that they are, uh, but ultimately that's uh, for the American people to judge. Okay. Michelle. Pretty striking today your Prime Minister Netanyahu expressed so emphatically his commitment to a two-state solution, mm -hmm. which is a lot different than what we heard from him just a couple of months ago. So to what extent does the President believe that he is truly committed to that, and what does the White House expect to see in terms of that commitment coming from Israel right now? Well, uh, those kinds of comments are, uh, are obviously encouraging. Uh, but. What's most important will not be the uh, comments, but the follow through. And uh, the more important judge uh, of that follow through than the United States uh, will be the Israeli people, the Palestinian people, and the leaders of the Palestinian people. Uh, that ultimately for uh, this kind of two-state solution to take root, or for at least us to advance the process in that direction, uh, both sides are going to need to take some steps to build confidence in one another. Uh, and it means that um, you know, we're going to need to see a, uh, um, a reduction, if not an end, to the violence. Uh, we certainly are going to need to see an end to the incitement. Uh, and you know, we're going to need to see a willingness on the part 
uh, of both sides to uh, uh, engage constructively. Uh, you know, and, and to be fair about it, you know, one thing that we have said is that continued Israeli uh, settlement construction is counterproductive to that process. And there's some work uh, that both sides need to do, uh, but the United States will uh, continue to strongly support that process. Uh, we certainly believe it's in the best interests of uh, the leaders, uh, of the people on both sides, for the process to move in that direction. And the United States will continue to uh, be helpful as they do. Uh, but the United States will also uh, stand shoulder to shoulder with our allies in Israel when it comes to their security. Uh, and uh, that's an important part of the conversation taking place today as well about what, uh, how the United States can take uh, the uh, historically strong connections between uh, our military and our intelligence communities uh, and further uh, deepen those connections and further intensify uh, that coordination to provide for the security of the nation of Israel, uh, but also to uh, augment the security architecture of the United States. Do you believe what Netanyahu says about wanting that two-state solution and wanting peace when we all know that that settlement activity only continues no matter how many times the White House expresses its displeasure at that? Well, uh, Michelle, I, I, I think the way to, the way to judge uh, the priorities of any government uh, is to take a look at what they're doing and to examine the follow-through. Uh, and this is certainly an opportunity for Prime Minister uh, Netanyahu uh, to, um, to try to put forward some uh, ideas to move this process in the direction of a two-state solution. Uh, you know, I think we've been quite candid about the fact that uh, given the dynamic on both sides, uh, that it's unlikely that that two-state solution will be reached in the next uh, 14 months. It's even unlikely that uh, talks uh, in pursuit of that two-state solution will begin in the next 14 months. Uh, but if there's anything that we can do to try to move the process in that direction, uh, then we certainly want to be supportive of efforts on both sides to do that. So can we be virtually assured then that President Obama will bring up the settlement activity? And is there ever going to be a situation where you know, you arrive at something that the, the next MOU would be affected by that, or that if that doesn't stop, then, it, then it's going to affect the amount of assistance that Israel gets. Or, or would you say that those things are, are completely separate? Well, uh, for whether or not it came up in the meeting, I, I, I can't speak to that because, as I mentioned, it was still ongoing and I but walked expect, out here. But Well, I, I think what I would expect is that there would be a discussion about trying to uh, resolve the uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict and steps that uh, Israel could take to move that process uh, in the direction of a two-state solution. Um, but, I, I, you know, as it relates to settlement building, I don't know if it will come, with, come up in the context of their talks, but it certainly is not uh, uh, a position that we have been reluctant to um, state, uh, either publicly or privately. When it comes to our, the commitment of the United States to Israel's security, uh, that commitment is unshakable, uh, and uh, for a variety of reasons. The first is that Israel is the uh, strongest ally of the United States in that region of the world. Uh, and uh, improving and strengthening uh, Israel's security is good for the national security of the United States. Um, to say nothing of the uh, important ties between uh, the U.S. and Israeli people uh, and the uh, values that we share that both countries uh, and citizens of both countries hold dear. Uh, so there are a variety of reasons about why those bonds are so strong. Uh, and those bonds are unshakable. And uh, you know, we may have our disagreements uh, about uh, how to pursue our shared objectives, as we saw on display uh, as we uh, uh, completed the international agreement to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. Uh, we've even had some differences of opinion when it comes to uh, the peace process. Uh, but that has not uh, affected. Uh, the commitment of this administration or this country uh, to uh, Israel's security. Okay. And lastly, we've heard from now the Israeli defense minister that it was likely that a bomb brought down that Russian plane. <coughs> uh, the British prime minister said it was likely to be a bomb. We've heard from intelligence officials, uh, members of Congress saying that this is likely terrorism, that the intelligence is pointing that way. So why has the White House been so reluctant, reluctant to say that the evidence that the U.S. has is at the very least 
pointing strongly in that direction. Well, Michelle, I just don't have an updated uh, intelligence assessment to share. I think, um, uh, at least with, uh, you know, with all due respect to those members of Congress, they have uh, um, a little more latitude uh, to make those kinds of pronouncements uh, than, uh, than I do uh, or other individuals who uh, represent the, the U.S. government uh, are able to. Um, so, you know, we're yeah. going to uh, continue to learn as much as we can about this, uh, about what exactly occurred. Uh, and, you know, if and when we have an updated intelligence assessment to share with all of you, uh, then we'll do that. Okay. Uh, Francesca. Thanks, Josh. Uh, earlier you noted to April that the next time that we get to talk to the President, perhaps we can ask about Missouri and some of these other issues, mm -hmm. which brings me to the point that I brought up to you when you gave the week ahead last Friday, mm -hmm. which was that there was not a joint news conference today between the President and the Prime Minister. And I, you know, looking back through the history of every time the Prime Minister has been at the White House, there doesn't appear to have ever been a joint news conference between Prime Minister Netanyahu and President Obama uh, at this White House. And I, I wanted to ask you about that. You know, you couldn't say before why there wasn't going to be one today. And I wanted to know if you could explain that now. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, primarily Francesca, the goal was to spend uh, most of their time talking to each other and a little less time talking to the press. And uh, I hope you all don't take a personal offense at that. You shouldn't. Uh, I think it just reflects the. <laughs> I should have predicted. Uh, I, th I think it just reflects the the way that the schedule came together and their desire to cover what is I think is a a quite wide ranging agenda. Uh, both uh, men, however, do feel a responsibility to make sure that uh, the citizens of the United States and Israel are aware of their uh, conversations, and so uh, that's why you know both men uh, spoke to. Uh, representatives of the press uh, in the Oval Office today. Uh, and it's why I'm out here you know, trying to answer your questions to the best I can uh, about what they discussed. And I assume that, um, uh, that someone, uh, a member of Prime Minister Netanyahu's traveling party is doing something similar. Um, and that's, uh, that's fine. I, I, you know, I, I do remember that when President Obama traveled to Israel uh, for um, an important meeting that Prime Minister Netanyahu hosted, that they did have a, have a news conference there. Uh, and uh, I didn't do the same homework that you did, but I, I wouldn't be surprised that if in at least one of the previous um, pool sprays that the two leaders hosted in the Oval Office, uh, if uh, the leaders didn't take a, a, a shouted question uh, occasionally. Um, but, uh, you know, the fact is this is a, uh, an important meeting, and uh, we certainly have uh, an interest in making sure that they can have a robust private conversation. Uh, but also an interest in making sure that all of you and the American people understand uh, uh, exactly what uh, was on the agenda and what progress we were able to make. And if I may, mm -hmm. I, I did do a little bit more homework on that. And okay. they, they have taken questions in the past during the pool sprays. At first I thought maybe it was because, you know, the pool spray became, came at the top of the meeting. But in my research I also found that at times in the past they have taken questions even when the pool spray came at the top of the meeting. Mm -hmm. but, but that also brings me to another point though, it, as to why the pool spray wasn't at the bottom of the meeting to where questions about what was discussed could have been asked so that we don't have to keep badgering you about what happened in a meeting that ended after you came into this room. Yeah. Well, I, first of all, I don't mind. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not offended. Um, but the, look, I, I think what they wanted to do was to try to give both the American people and the Israeli people uh, a sense of what was on the agenda for their meeting. And I do think they also wanted to protect their ability to have private conversations uh, that, uh, with regard to a couple of the items on the agenda, uh, they're a work in progress. Uh, and that would certainly include uh, the effort to move forward on a memorandum of understanding uh, when it comes to military assistance that the United States provides to Israel. So uh, I'm confident that, that we'll have uh, you know, future opportunities to talk about uh, the importance of this relationship uh, and the importance of the conversation that uh, took place this morning and may even still be underway uh, in the Oval Office as we speak. Here it's over, but thank you. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Vaccaro. Thank you, Mr. Ernest. Uh, keeping with Israel relations, in March, in the wake of the Prime Minister's um, backing away from the two-state solution on key of the elections, and some other comments he had made uh, as the elections were nearing. You said, I believe it was you, said we're going to reevaluate our thinking about the relationship, particularly as it pertains to the U.S. stance to the United Nations. What is the status of that reevaluation? Well, 
Uh, Mike, what I uh, talked about at that point was a reassessment of our position toward the two-state solution. Our commitment to Israel's security uh, and our alliance with Israel is something that uh, is unshakable and has not been called into a question despite the spirited uh, disagreement that we had over the uh, international agreement to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon, for example. Uh, but there was a reassessment that was um, uh, conducted about uh, our policy toward a two-state solution and uh, whether or not that's something that uh, was viable moving forward given the, given the public comments of uh, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu earlier this year. And, um, you know, essentially, you know, part of the outgrowth of that reassessment uh, was the observation that was made at the end of last week by uh, White House officials that um, a two-state solution uh, was um, not going to happen while President Obama was still in office, uh, and that even the possibility of talks uh, about a two-state solution between the Israelis and Palestinians was um, unlikely uh, over the course of the next 14 or 15 months. However, uh, if there is an opportunity uh, for us to try to move the process in that direction, short of talks, uh, that's something that the United States remains committed to, primarily because uh, we believe that uh, ultimately resolving this conflict would be in the best interest of American national security. Uh, but resolving this conflict in the context of a two-state solution uh, would also be in the best interest of both the Israeli people and the Palestinian people. So uh, you know, this is a, a goal that we still believe in. Uh, it's a goal that we believe the Israelis and Palestinians should pursue. Uh, but it's our view that it's not a goal that's going to be reached uh, in the next, uh, in the remainder of the president's term in office. Okay. Uh, different subject, please. Okay. Guantanamo. Sure. Does the president have the constitutional authority to close Guantanamo, notwithstanding the will of Congress? Mm -hmm. Well, I I know that there was a uh, um, a high-profile argument uh, made over the weekend. Well, triggered uh, by your comments here. Sure. Sure. And. Uh, I guess my point is that the, you know, the argument that, um, uh, about the President's authority is certainly something that uh, you know, Mr. Craig is, uh, is well positioned to make. But the focus of our efforts right now uh, is on Congress. Uh, and there are members of Congress who share this goal and who have indicated a, at least an openness to trying to working with the administration to uh, achieve this goal. And so that's the, that's the focus of our efforts right now. I'm not aware of any ongoing effort to devise a, uh, uh, and, uh, any, uh, a strategy using only the President's executive authority to accomplish this goal. Uh, but I certainly wouldn't, um, as I mentioned last week, take that option off the table. But there's, is there a consideration? Of, there's no thinking of an ongoing option or whatever, however you just phrased it. But there's obviously a consideration of a legal standing and legal opinion and, and legal abilities, constitutional authority. What is the status of that thing? Well, there are, there are a wide range of thorny legal questions that are raised by um, this ongoing effort to close the prison at Guantanamo Bay. And uh, I wouldn't um, sort of speculate on those right now. These are obviously, uh, you know, in some cases, because of the uh, unique nature of this facility, uh, you know, in some cases we're in uh, uncharted legal waters here. Uh, but you know, the president made clear from his uh, first week in office uh, that closing the prison at Guantanamo Bay is a national security priority, and this is a conclusion that was shared by former President uh, George W. Bush. It's a conclusion that is shared by secretaries of state that have served presidents dating all the way back to Nixon. Uh, I know that the three most recent um, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, Admiral Mullen, General Dempsey, and uh, obviously General Dunford all share uh, this view. So the brightest and most influential foreign policy thinkers in America who are most focused on national security uh, are convinced that closing the prison at Guantanamo Bay uh, is uh, an important thing to do uh, because it's good for the country and good for our security. We just got to get Congress to go along. I'm not you know, I know you don't want to give away the game, but I'm not asking you to speculate. I'm just wondering if the White House has an opinion of, as to the legality or the constitutional power the President has to close it without mm -hmm. the bill of Congress. And, and uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is I'm, I don't – presumably somebody somewhere has done some kind of analysis on this. I'm not aware uh, of what that uh, analysis was or what the conclusion was. All I'm suggesting is that our top priority is to work with Congress to get this done. Uh, and I'm certainly not going to uh, take off the table any fallback options that may or may not be available to the President. And when will we hear uh, – see the plan or know the plan? 
Uh, well, this is something that we've obviously been working on for quite some time, uh, and there's some uh, legwork that the Department of Defense has engaged in in terms of making site visits and doing some other um, planning uh, so that they could present you know, a thoughtful, uh, carefully considered plan uh, to Congress. And you know, our hope right now is that Congress uh, won't just reflexively play politics with that plan, but they'll actually devote a similar level of thought and consideration uh, to this proposal. Okay. Ron. Um, the meeting with the Prime Minister, how did this come about? Did Prime Minister Netanyahu request the meeting? Uh, why did the, the President invite him at this time now? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Ron, I actually, I, I have to admit I don't recall sort of who invited whom here, but uh, I do know that there was a desire uh, on the part of both leaders to uh, sit down and renew uh, their engagement. It's been uh, you know, more than a year since they've had an opportunity to meet uh, in person. They've obviously spoken on the phone uh, a number of times uh, in that period. Uh, but you know, this is an opportunity for uh, them to sit down and talk about uh, all the things we have in common. Our shared values and our shared national security priorities uh, are far more numerous than uh, even the, some of the significant disagreements that, uh, that we've had in the past. I, I ask because obviously there's been a lot said about the personal dynamic between them, which is why I'm trying to get a sense of, you can say, who made the, who reached out their hand first, if you will. Well, I guess, uh, I, I, I just don't have that in front of me. I, I, I don't know, remember what the answer to that question is. But I guess I would suggest that that's uh, probably uh, not the most effective way to uh, uh, draw a conclusion about their interpersonal uh, relationship. I, I think both of them would be the first to tell you that they have a, an effective professional uh, relationship that allows them to advance the interests of their two countries and to, most importantly, uh, advance the, our shared interests. That's what you expect uh, the leaders of uh, allied nations to do. And that's what uh, uh, President Obama and Prime Minister Netanyahu have successfully done for seven years now. And when you came out, I think the meeting has been going on for more than two hours, roughly. Um, did, did you have a sense of how it was going? Mm -hmm. uh, I did. I, there's a, um, uh, there are a couple different sort of uh, configurations of the meeting with number of staff in the room. And so I did talk to one staff member who was uh, in the room for a, a, a good chunk of the uh, meeting this morning. And, um, you know, he observed that, that, that this was a, uh, an important opportunity for uh, the two sides to get together and discuss something that uh, had been discussed uh, among other members of their respective national security teams. That, you know, obviously um, uh, Susan Rice, the national security advisor, had an opportunity to visit with her uh, counterpart. Uh, you'll recall that the defense minister for Israel, uh, Mr. Yalon, was in uh, the United States uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, meeting with his uh, uh, counterparts here in the United States. Uh, General Dunford, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, was uh, uh, was in Israel a couple of weeks ago uh, to meet with some of his counterparts. So there's been a lot of work done in preparation for this meeting, and this was an opportunity for them to follow up on that preparatory work. Based on your conversation with that aide, can you give us any sense of how the beginning of this meeting unfolded? What issues came up first? Where did they go? What, um, uh, the, the, the part of the meeting that he talked about was some of the work that, uh, that both sides, I think, are interested in doing to advance our military cooperation. Uh, and this was, you know, part of the this is uh, the work that will go into uh, what hopefully will be the signing of a memorandum of understanding to um, plan for the continued military cooperation between our two countries and the military assistance that the United States will provide to ensure that Israel has the capacity to uh, defend herself. Uh, the, the, the discussion centered on the need to conduct a careful assessment of the broader security situation in the Middle East to assess what sort of uh, threats and risk uh, Israel faces. Uh, then also to conduct an assessment of the capabilities and technology and equipment that Israel already has uh, and assess how those current capabilities uh, match up with the um, current assessment of the threats uh, and then m determine uh, what sort of assistance the United States could provide to try to bridge that, uh, to sort of uh, you know, bridge that gap. Uh, and uh, I described that to you to make clear that I don't anticipate, even though I walked out here before the meeting ended, I do not anticipate that there will be a, um, a commitment uh, on the Memorandum of Understanding uh, today. But there was a discussion about the work that can be done cooperatively uh, at 
uh, among the national security teams uh, to advance this process. And the process will look like what I just described to you. You mentioned the reassessment of the two-state solution policy. That, those statements were very definitive that the United States, that the President doesn't see this happening on his watch. Uh, why was that made so public just before the Prime Minister came? And was that communicated to him before he came? He, he had to be aware of it, obviously. Yeah, I, I, I don't get the impression that, um, uh, that, that, uh, there, uh, that officials uh, in the Israeli government were particularly surprised by those comments. For that matter, I don't think there are many officials in the U.S. government that were surprised uh, by that assessment. Um, given the, the nature of the situation there right now and given the um, pretty stark uh, divide uh, between the uh, Israeli leaders and Palestinian leaders right now. Uh, there's a lot of work that uh, is going to need to be done uh, to try to uh, bridge those gaps and even get them back into a place where they can sit down uh, at the negotiating table and have a, a trusted conversation. Uh, and I'm not even sure that that work, to get them back to the table, uh, will be completed in the next 14 months. In fact, I think it's unlikely that it will. Given that assessment, I hate to be blunt, but doesn't the Prime Minister's assurances that they're committed to peace sound very hollow? Well, uh, no, they don't to me at least. And I, I, I think that um, Prime Minister Netanyahu has a solemn responsibility when he's leading the, the nation of Israel. He was elected by the people of that country uh, to protect that country uh, and um, particularly mindful of the grave risks that, that that country faces given uh, the dangerous neighborhood in which they live. Uh, and so, um, yeah. you know, I. I I think the best way, however, for people to assess uh, how genuine those claims are is to see the degree to which uh, his administration is willing to follow through on those comments. Uh, and uh, I'm confident that that's what the, uh, that's certainly what the, what the Obama administration will, do, will, will be doing. And uh, I'd anticipate that other governments around the world will be doing the same thing. So you think it is possible that the Prime Minister could return home and initiate some policies that could reverse the, your perception of the administration's perception that the two-state solution is dead? I think it is possible that, uh, that the Prime Minister Netanyahu could uh, make some commitments and uh, send some quite clear signals uh, that they are, um, that they're recommitted to uh, trying to advance uh, a peace process and a, uh, a process toward a two-state solution. I'll just point out, though, that's, that's certainly not going to be enough. Uh, we're going to need to see a commitment on the part of the Palestinian leaders, too. Uh, to ending in violence and ending uh, incitement and um, demonstrating their commitment to uh, negotiating in good faith. And those shows of good faith aren't um, the kinds of things that materialize over time and they don't show, they don't inspire faith. Um, let me say, say that again. They aren't the kinds of things that materialize immediately uh, and they aren't the kinds of things that demonstrate faith or inspire faith immediately. These are the kinds of things that uh, uh, can be um, these are the kinds of policy changes that can be instituted over time, uh, and over time they will build a sufficient confidence and sufficient faith to bring both sides back to the negotiating table and try to uh, advance toward a goal uh, that, um, that uh, serves the interests of both sides. In some ways, that's what um, continues to be tragic about the situation, uh, that I think there is pretty widespread agreement about what is in the best interests of people on both sides of this conflict. Uh, and um, but yet, despite that recognition, um, uh, you know, it's not, uh, the two sides haven't been able to reach it. And lastly, is the President going to press the Prime Minister, or do you think he did on this particular issue of the, of the, uh, of the, of the two-state solution? And is there going to be any follow-up post this meeting with the Palestinian side by any level of the administration? Mm -hmm. Or do you think that this is really just something that um, is going to, well, not fall by the wayside, will fall by the wayside unless you see something clear and bold by, by, the, by the Israelis. Uh, I'm confident that there will be, uh, uh, that at, at some level, uh, there'll be some follow-up with the Palestinians. As you know, you know Secretary Kerry, uh, um, you know, while he obviously frequently talks to uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, uh, it's certainly not unusual for him to have conversations with President Abbas either. And, um, you know, I don't, I'm not suggesting that that, that will take place at that level, but uh, I just do that to illustrate the, the kind of open line of communication that exists between the United States and Palestinian authorities. So not, not, we shouldn't expect much? 
Uh, well, I think that there are some important things that we can advance. Uh, and I think there is an opportunity for us to um, lay out a path to eventually completing a memorandum of understanding. Uh, this is the kind of security assistance that is clearly in the best interest of the United States and our national security, uh, but is also critical to making sure that Israel has uh, the capacity to defend itself when necessary. And I, that's a critically important work. Uh, there continue to be, as the President alluded to at the top of the meeting, uh, a conversation about the work that can be done to verify Iran's uh, ongoing compliance with the agreement uh, and uh, our work together to counter uh, Iran's destabilizing activities in the region that pose uh, a threat to the United States in our interests, but also pose a pretty direct threat uh, to Israel as well. So there's important work uh, that needs to be done, uh, but uh, I don't think all of the biggest problems are going to be solved uh, just in the context of this meeting. Okay. Jordan. Thanks, Josh. I want to ask you about a different topic. Uh, Senator Reid and Leader Pelosi have been pushing to repeal the Cadillac tax as part of Obamacare. And I'm wondering if the White House is willing to uh, negotiate on that paperwork. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Jordan, we've been, uh, you know, quite clear about, uh, uh, about that specific policy. Uh, and uh, the reason that this is um, important uh, is the first is that um, it's important for the Affordable Care Act to be a fiscally responsible plan. Uh, and this is part of, uh, 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 of ensuring that we uh, can make progress uh, on the fiscal scale. Uh, and, you know, one of, the, um, one of the important benefits of the Affordable Care Act is it actually reduces the deficit. Uh, and that a fiscally responsible approach to this challenge is, uh, uh, is an important part of that. Uh, I think the other thing that this, uh, that this policy does is it gives employers um, with high cost plans uh, an incentive to make those plans more efficient. Uh, and you know, there's some academic research to indicate that as those plans become more efficient, the money that had previously gone into um, those uh, benefits actually go back into paychecks, go back into direct compensation to uh, employees. So as long as we're having a conversation uh, about the fact that there's more work that can be done to raise wages in this country, this would actually be an important thing that, that we could do uh, in a way that um, you know, certainly still allows employees to enjoy the benefits of a high quality uh, health care plan. Uh, but also uh, getting some greater comp compensation here, uh, and raising you know raising paychecks and raising wages is uh, you know continues to be a top policy priority. I think the other thing that's important, uh, Jordan, for people to understand is that uh, this law does not take effect until 2018. Uh, so you know we'll be able to, to continue to evaluate exactly how it would uh, go into effect, uh, and if in that intervening time uh, there are ideas that are put forward that will strengthen the law. Uh, then we're open to a, to a conversation uh, about that. Uh, but uh, it's important that people not overlook uh, the benefits of this policy. So you would be open to tweaks if, let's say, Democrats were to offer a different pay for to make up for the, the deficit hold that getting rid of the Cadillac tax would? Well, I, I, I'm, not gonna, I'm certainly not going to negotiate it from here. And I, that wouldn't address uh, all of the benefits that I uh, raised here about being important, particularly when it comes to uh, the consequences or the impact of this policy uh, proposal uh, having a positive impact on wages. Uh, so, um, so look, you know, we this is a policy that goes into effect in 2018. We are um, always uh, in a position to have conversations with people that have an authentic interest in strengthening the Affordable Care Act. Uh, the president has never taken the position uh, that. Um, there aren't creative ways to further improve upon and strengthen the Affordable Care Act. And if, if people have ideas for doing that, then we're open to that uh, conversation. Unfortunately, so much of what com has come out of Congress uh, has been uh, uh, an effort to undermine uh, and even repeal the law. Uh, and we spent so much time talking about that, we haven't talked about uh, some of the things that could be done uh, to, to strengthen the law. And uh, you know, I would note, and we can follow up with the details on this, follow up with you on the details on this. But in the last six or eight weeks, the President has signed a couple of pieces of legislation that have uh, slightly, but uh, slightly reformed the law in a way that strengthens it. Uh, and so we can cover, we can follow up with you on the details on that. Okay. Mike. 
Uh, two unrelated questions. First, uh, on the ISIL Russia uh, thing, uh, does President Obama plan to meet with President Putin at the G20 meeting or otherwise in this trip? And would you expect that they would discuss the downing of the Russian plane? Uh, I'm not aware of any uh, of any planned meetings uh, with uh, with uh, Mr. Putin. But we'll have some more details about the president's schedule, both for the G20 meeting, but also for the rest of the president's trip um, in the next couple of days. Um, but I, I certainly wouldn't rule out, um, you know, the kinds of uh, uh, discussions that we've seen in the past, where they, you know, they're, uh, you know, either in the hallway together or you know, in some other place where they have a, uh, an informal opportunity to to talk. So, but I, but my point is that I. I I do not know at this point of any sort of planned uh, formal bilateral meeting between the two leaders. Conversation soon or something about the data of this uh, If something like that occurs, we'll definitely let you know. The other question, Volkswagen today offered to give a $500 rebate to all the people who owned the cars that have been implicated in the um, cheating emission scandal, mm -hmm. uh, and I guess the dealership credit as well. Uh, some of the Democratic members of Congress, I think including Senators Blumenthal and Markey, said this was an insulting offer. What's the White House view? Well, I wouldn't weigh in on this. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, Volkswagen is uh, uh, dealing with a, a pretty significant challenge. Uh, and um, you know, I, I'm not going to uh, um, evaluate their crisis communications effort uh, from here. Or the, uh, um, the maybe, actual Maybe at a future stage in my career I'll do that, but uh, <laughs> not in the current stage. They're offering, they're not evaluating the crisis communications, they're evaluating the substance of what they're doing. Yeah. yeah. Would you evaluate that? Uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Alexis. Josh, quick questions. Um, as you know, General Campbell had promised an initial uh, findings report on the Afghan hospital bombing within a month, and that month passed. And there's been interest in Capitol Hill on where that initial report is. Can you say whether you know the progress uh, that's being made there and whether the President has seen an initial report or a findings yet? Uh, I know that this is something that the Department of Defense has been working on, and I know that they've made progress on their report. Uh, but where it currently stands, I'm not able to, uh, to comment on. Uh, the, what the President has said is that he expects a, uh, a thorough, objective, and full accounting uh, of what exactly occurred, and he expects the Department of Defense to be as transparent as possible uh, about those findings. And so uh, I would anticipate that once a, a final report has been completed that uh, the President will take a look at it uh, closely, uh, but that as much of it as possible uh, will be released to the public because that's uh, the expectation that the <coughs> President has about um, the importance of being uh, transparent with this accountant. And uh, just just to clarify, to your knowledge, he has not received anything yet, or you know that? Uh, to my knowledge, he has not seen a draft report or an interim report or anything like that. I um, I can't speak to whether to what degree he has gotten um, verbal updates or uh, you know or or even uh, uh, updates that might may be in a written form but not uh, reflective of the final report. Um, but uh, I, I know the President is um, eager for that full accounting, but is also wants to make sure that the review that's done is one that is thorough and objective and uh, eventually transparent. And one other follow-up on Guantanamo Bay. Um, if the President is successful in um, uh, taking the, the current number of detainees and prisoners and shifting them somewhere else and shutting the prison, does he mean shutting the prison as in removing all the prisoners who are there, or would he actually like to close the prison and dismantle it, if he could, under his presidency? Uh, you mean like the physical structure of, I'm, I'm not sure. Does he envision the prison continuing to exist there, but without any population of detainees there, or would he actually like symbolically to dismantle it? Yeah, uh, I'm not sure what plans uh, the Department of Defense would have uh, for something like that. I don't know if they would, Certainly the President would not envision leaving the building there uh, or the facilities there uh, in case there, the need arises to detain additional people there. The President does not envision that scenario. Uh, the goal of uh, closing the prison is to uh, ensure that, uh, uh, you know, that we're sort of living up to uh, our values when it comes to um, uh, dealing with these individuals. 
but I, I don't know what eventual plans the, Bar the Department of Defense may have for uh, the facilities there. Okay. Kevin. Thanks, Josh. Has the gap interpersonally, from a communications perspective, uh, between the President and the Prime Minister been overestimated? And if not, does a meeting like today's bridge such a gap? Well, uh, Kevin, I think as the President said when he sat down uh, with Prime Minister Netanyahu today, there's no world leader with whom he's had the opportunity to meet more often. Uh, than Prime Minister Netanyahu, and I think that's a, a testament to the bonds between our country, our two countries. It's also a testament to the effectiveness of the working relationship between the two men. Uh, it doesn't mean that they have agreed on every issue, uh, and it doesn't mean that they are the best of friends, uh, but it does mean that they are able to work effectively together uh, to advance the interests of the citizens of their countries, uh, but also to advance the shared interests of our alliance. Will you be making an announcement on an aid package any time in the days ahead? Uh, I certainly wouldn't anticipate uh, an announcement on a memorandum of understanding uh, in the near term. Uh, this, there's some important work that needs to be done to uh, conduct an analysis of the broader threats uh, in the region, to conduct a review of the capabilities that uh, Israel currently possesses, and then to do an analysis of uh, how the United States could assist in uh, meeting those uh, unmet needs. Uh, and uh, I wouldn't anticipate that that process will take a really long time. Uh, but it's not something that you can do quickly. The President wants to be thoughtful about and strategic uh, about, uh, uh, about this because this is essentially going to chart the course of our important military to military relationship uh, over the next decade. On the shooting, was this a, an infiltration? Was this a friendly fire circumstance? Uh, you're talking about the situation in Jordan? I am. Uh, this is a situation that is uh, still under investigation uh, and determining what the motive was of this individual. Uh, what this, you know, whether or not this person had some sort of um, uh, affiliation uh, that's unknown. Uh, at this point, uh, you know, there's an ongoing investigation. Uh, we are pleased with the cooperation that we've gotten from the Jordanians thus far in trying to get to the bottom of what exactly happened. Is it fair to say we, this person was not among the trainees, or we don't know? That. Uh, the role that this person had on the complex is something that uh, is also part of the investigation. On climate, um, you've mentioned the importance of getting the major economies, in particular around the world, involved in, in Paris. And I'm curious about the burgeoning economy in India. Uh, is there also a push to get the Indian government uh, to make strategic steps to be a part of a larger global push to uh, cut down on uh, particulates into the uh, atmosphere? Mm -hmm. There are, um, we certainly would expect that uh, India would um, contribute to this broader global effort. And this is something that is economically challenging uh, for India, as the Indian government would be the first to tell you. Uh, but at the same time, we have seen India take important steps in the past. And there was earlier in the President's administration a, a commitment that was made by the Indians to uh, limit hydrofluorocarbons. Uh, and uh, that was, uh, these are uh, you know, pollutants that have a much more significant impact on bring about climate change than um, uh, just the, than the, uh, than the burning of uh, oil and gas. Uh, so you know, there, there's been a willingness on the part of the Indians in the past to make important commitments that uh, contribute to this broader um, uh, effort, uh, but we certainly would uh, like to see a country with an economy as large as uh, India uh, step up and um, make an important contribution to this effort. Will they be a part of the events in Paris? Uh, I don't know what their plans are for Paris, but you can check with them. Okay. Lastly, I want to ask you about, as a fellow a native Missourian, mm -hmm. uh, about what happened in Colombia today. What would you say to the people who feel like if a small group can effectively usher out the leadership of a major university like that, rather than work with the leadership uh, through the grievance process, what does that say? Mm -hmm. Well, Kevin, I think what's notable about this particular situation is that you had uh, a small group uh, on campus uh, mobilize other voices on campus that um, all spoke out together. Uh, and I don't think that this, this started, I think the point is this did start with a small group of people. Uh, but you quickly saw uh, them build support all across campus, uh, even, uh, even among the non-black uh, student population. Uh, and I think that is, uh, again, a testament to the shared values of that community uh, and a commitment uh, to fighting um, hate uh, and intolerance uh, and promoting an atmosphere uh, where all the students who are admitted to that university can find a home there. 
Uh, and that is a significant challenge that uh, doesn't just stand before the University of Missouri. Uh, this stands before uh, colleges and universities all across the country. And I would anticipate that uh, while the University of Missouri is the, uh, apparently the first one to have such a high profile debate about some of these issues, I'm confident it's not the last. But I'm just wondering about the process. Rather than working with leadership <coughs> to sort of usher out a university president uh, in the wake of uh, admittedly terrible situations on and around the campus. Uh, I'm, I'm hearing from lots of people in Missouri, even family members, who suggest to me that seems an extreme way to go about figuring out the best way forward for our community. Can well, you understand that, that perspective? Well, I guess what I, I think that what's, I would disagree simply because, you know, we saw leaders in the, on the Mizzou campus uh, also speak up and raise concerns uh, in this regard. We saw the, um, Coach Pinkle is one of the most influential voices on that campus, if not the most influential. I saw the tweet. Uh, certainly the highest paid. Uh, yeah. And, um, <laughs> and um, you know, he made his voice heard in this process. And as I mentioned earlier, um, I think it was uh, Dr. Bowen, who uh, is the leading administrator on the, with responsibility for the Columbia campus, uh, visited the students who were uh, camping out in protest. Uh, and he brought them food and spent some time uh, talking to them yesterday. And I, again, I, I think that is a, an indication that you saw uh, people trying to bridge divides inside that community. And I think their willingness to come together to confront some of these issues and to confront head on the concerns that had been uh, raised by some of the uh, black students at Missouri, I think is uh, an encouraging development. Uh, and th these are concerns that initially fell on deaf ears. Uh, and because of the um, the courage of those students to speak up uh, and their effectiveness in enlisting others in support of their cause uh, and the commitment on the part of the entire community to come together even across racial lines to stand up for the concerns that are expressed by one part of that community. I think that's, um, uh, you know, I, I certainly can't speak to the legalities of the process, uh, but, uh, you know, as somebody who is not steeped in those details, uh, I think that's a pretty good way for the process to work. Uh, and uh, it certainly reflects the kind of, um, I think it does reflect the way that we want uh, our young people in this country uh, to advocate for themselves and for their society. Uh, and, um, you know, so I, th it, this is a, a really interesting thing that's happening at the University of Missouri. And it certainly, uh, you know, to delve back into crisis communications, this is probably not, these are probably not the kind of headlines uh, that the University of Missouri would uh, like to be making across the country. But I think there's a, a, a reason today for a lot of people affiliated with the University of Missouri to be quite proud of their institution today. Uh, and I hope that they are. Carol. I'm going to follow on the Gitmo planning. Is the plan for you to, to present to send it to the Hill this week? Is that what you said? Uh, I wouldn't put a time frame on it. Uh, the, we, this is something that uh, obviously we've been working on for quite some time. I know we talked about this even over the summer. Um, so uh, there's a lot of work that's gone into this. And as I mentioned, you know, Department of Defense personnel have visited locations in, uh, in Kansas and South Carolina and in Colorado. So uh, there's been some uh, legwork uh, on this uh, project that's been visible. Uh, there's also been some other work that's been done that uh, hasn't been visible yet. Uh, but uh, when we put a, a plan forward, which hopefully will be relatively soon, uh, we won't just make it public to members of Congress. We'll, we'll make it uh, Publics that all of you will have an opportunity to take a look at it as well. Is there any concern that it's too late because the NDAA has advanced already? Uh, no, there's not. There's not concern that it's too late. I, I, I think the you know the sense is is that we're going to need some cooperation from uh, Congress uh, in order to advance this priority, and that would be true whether or not the uh, NDAA had passed or not. Um, so no, it's not too late. So, but is the goal to influence the NDAA that sets policy for 2016? So that's the one that's already passed in the House yeah. and is going to be taken up in the Senate. If it has that effect, then we'll take it. Uh, but it's not, uh, it's not necessary at so this point. To be open to having the outlines of his plan set for policy in 2017, meaning that would he be satisfied uh, with Guantanamo being on the track to close once he leaves office, or is his goal to have it completely closed? His goal is to have it closed uh, on his watch as he promised. Uh, but um, that's, that, that, that's been our goal since, uh, I think, the President's second full day in office. 
Uh, it continues to be our uh, goal today. Uh, the truth is this is a goal we would have accomplished some time ago had Congress not gotten in the way. Uh, and um, you know, the President's determined to uh, make as much progress on this uh, as he can, and his goal continues to be to close it before he leaves office. On the Netanyahu meeting last week, uh, the President had said that the, the goal was that to have at the end of the meeting each leader give direction to their respective teams on how to move forward with the MOU. Can you talk about what direction was given to their respective teams and what the next step would be in that process? Uh, well, uh, this is part of what, uh, what was under discussion based on the readout that I received from the meeting this morning. And, uh, you know, both leaders basically demonstrated a, uh, a commitment to their teams working together uh, in pursuit of the process that I laid out just a little bit earlier, uh, conducting a, uh, an analysis of the uh, threats in the region, uh, particularly as they relate to Israel, uh, conducting an analysis of the uh, capabilities that Israel has to meet those threats, uh, and conducting a review to determine uh, what sort of assistance the United States could provide to try to bridge uh, those gaps. Uh, and what I'm asking is, that did, they, did the Israelis come with a specific list of things that they would want, and did the U.S. side have the list of things that they were willing to, to do? Was it that kind of detail, or uh, was it broad I, strips? I can't speak to what lists the Israelis may have, may have uh, brought along, but the, the, as it relates to our posture on this, um, you know, the President's view is this is something that we should sort of conduct this analysis first, uh, and then we can start reviewing what sort of capabilities and equipment and technology could be used to bridge those gaps, and that's uh, the most effective way for the President, in the President's mind, to pursue this. Okay. Jared, I'll give you the last one. Thanks, Josh. Uh, one of the, following up on Carol's question, one of the big reasons that Israel says it needs a significantly larger commitment from the United States annually is because it says that the world is much more dangerous uh, because of the Iran nuclear deal. Is uh, will without obviously you're not going to confirm what's in a future memorandum of understanding, but uh, would a increase, a significant increase, especially of the military aid given annually, be a tacit uh, concession that the world is more dangerous because of the Iran nuclear deal? Uh, it would not, uh, primarily because the uh, president has made clear that our expectation that even after the completion of the agreement. Uh, you know, doesn't change, uh, it's not likely to change uh, Iran's behavior. Uh, our expectation is that uh, Iran will continue to carry out the kinds of destabilizing uh, activities that uh, do th pose a pretty direct threat to Israel, uh, but also pose a threat to uh, our interests in the region. Uh, we're mindful of that threat. The United States and Israel works together regularly to counter that threat. And there's an additional assistance that we can provide to the Israelis to further mitigate that threat, uh, then we'll do that. But that's something we would have done whether or not uh, we had succeeded in completing a, a deal to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon or not. What does it say about the United States' ability to influence uh, the, the positive or negative effects of the region when uh, Israel says that it's, it's more dangerous in the region now? Uh, are, are we able, or is this a failure of the administration's policies in the Middle East beyond Iran? that uh, Israel believes that it's in much, more, in much greater danger now? Well, Jared, I think I would just observe that the uh, Middle East would be much more dangerous if Iran had a nuclear weapon. Uh, and we've taken uh, verifiable steps in the context of this agreement to prevent that from happening. Beyond Iran, I'm talking about Syria and other parts of the region. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the reasons that Syria is such a dangerous place is because uh, Iran and their proxies have been heavily involved in uh, trying to shore up the Assad regime. So, um, you know, I, I do think that is uh, while a different country uh, is a, a, a similar dynamic that the United States and Israel must confront together because uh, it has risks uh, for our two countries. What are we to feed into uh, a future potential uh, increase for the uh, annual military aid given to Israel? Mm -hmm. uh, at this point, I'd encourage you not to read anything into it, uh, but rather to allow this uh, analysis to move forward. And uh, at some point uh, in the months ahead, I would anticipate we'll have uh, another discussion about this. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot, everybody.